It's time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is to the Premier. The Premier's decision to scrap the updated sexual health curriculum and drag Ontario back to 1998 is not about doing what's right for students or about listening to parents. It's about doing favours for social conservatives like Charles McVitie and Tanya Granick allen Why is the Premier more focused on keeping social conservatives happy instead of keeping students, young people and queer youth safe? Premier. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the question, Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, we traveled around Ontario. We consulted with thousands and tens of thousands of parents. We consulted with hundreds of teachers, and not one single person, Mr. Speaker, came up to me and said they were consulted. We heard that they want a change when it comes to the sex ed curriculum. And I know the Leader of the Opposition she would have heard the exact same thing on the campaign trail that I heard. Matter of fact, we're going to do the largest consultation in Ontario's history when it comes to the sex ed education. Mr. Speaker, we know there was close to zero consultation. Matter of fact, out of the 14 million people, there were 1,638 people that were consulted. 0 .00. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, the Premier is being driven by whatever far-right social conservatives want him to do and ignoring his responsibility to all Ontario students, all of our young people, and all of our queer youth and LGBTQ families. After spending all of yesterday trying to figure out what they were really doing, last night the Conservatives confirmed they are dragging students back to the 1998 health curriculum this September. I have a simple question for the Premier. Will the same-sex relationships and LGBTQ families be fully included and reflected in the curriculum this fall, or does he have to ask permission of radical extremists like Charles McVitie and Tanya allen -Granick? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we know that we know that the leader of opposition doesn't want to consult with parents. The leader of the opposition actually believes in the nanny state. They believe that the government knows best when it comes to our students. They know best when it comes to our children. They know best when it comes to our parents. We take a different approach, Mr. Speaker. We take an approach that the best teachers are the parents, not, not a group of special interest groups. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I will once again remind the Leader of the Opposition there is next to zero consultation. Out of people of 14 million people, 0.001% were consulted. That is disgusting. 0.001%. Final supplementary. What I know, best speaker, is that it is 2018, not 1998. Speaker, and the world has changed. Members, please take your seats. Please take your seats. A curriculum ignores consent, online safety, gender identity, and LGBTQ families. That's the curriculum that this Premier and his radical extremist friends are dragging our kids back to. The Deputy Premier, the Attorney General. The House will come to order. House will come to order. Leader of the Opposition. The Deputy Premier, Attorney General and Minister of Children and Youth have all in the past 
expressed their support for keeping kids safe. Why is this Premier listening to radical extremists like Charles McVitie and Tanya Granick Allen instead of his own cabinet and putting the safety of our young people at risk? Premier. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I find it pretty rich that the Leader of the Opposition would call us radical. House, please come to order. Please come to order. Right across from us. in the campaign, the Leader of the Opposition had to steal a couple of our lines. <laughs> My friends, we're, we, we are going to make sure we have the largest consultation in Ontario's history. We're going to go to every single riding and consult with the parents. Fine. I know the Leader of the Opposition doesn't believe in consulting with parents. She believes the government should make the decision for each and every one of us. She doesn't believe in consultation. Thank you. Thank we you. will fix the sex Thank you. Members, please take your seats. Please take your seats. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier. You know, the job of the Premier is not making backroom deals with insiders, but that's what this Premier is already up to on sex ed and on hydro. He said the CEO of hydro was going to get zero, absolutely zero. But Mayo Schmidt will actually walk away with at least $9 million, maybe more. Only the Premier knows the real answer, Speaker. So will the Premier make the deal public today so that everyone, all Ontarians, all the people, can see what he actually agreed to? Thank you. Premier? M Mr. Speaker, Leader of the Opposition knew exactly what the deal was. And I'll tell you the reason why the Leader of the Opposition knew exactly what the deal was because the Leader of the Opposition was down here for years propping up Hydro One, propping up the $6 million man, propping up the board. The Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker, she's in favour of high hydro rates. She's in favour of the highest hydro rates in North America. She's in favour of putting the burden of carbon tax and cap and trade on the backs of the taxpayers and small businesses in this province. My friend, leader of the op. Okay, okay. I can tell you one thing. Premier, Premier, Premier. You take your seat for a second. Premier, yeah. The House has to come to order. I can't hear the Premier. The Speaker has to be able to hear what's being said by the member who has the floor. The volume has to go down. Apologize to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, as I was saying, the leader of the opposition knew exactly the compensation package. She kept it under wraps. The leader of the opposition, I should say, kept it under wraps, not saying a word, knowing, knowing that he had stock options. I'll tell you, there's only one thing, one thing that the Hydro One CEO walked away with is the same package as anyone else would walk away with with their benefits and their pension plan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Members, please take your seats. I Supplementary. Because zero in this house is, and that's the knowledge that this premier has on what's happening in this legislature. Members, will please take their seats. Members, will please take their seats. Leader of the Opposition. The bottom line is this. This Premier said that the CEO would get zero, absolutely zero. But it 
turns out, whatever backroom deal that he cooked up with Mayo Schmidt will end up costing at least $9 million. Now, that's what privatized electricity does. That's what it does. And that's what this party supports. When, the pre when will the Premier Question. actually come clean and fully disclose and release the deal that he cut with Mayo Schmidt? Thank you. <laughs> Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I can see the Leader of the Opposition. I understand she doesn't like losing. She wants to get personal. She wants to get personal, but I'm not going to get personal with the Leader of the Opposition. I can, <laughs> I can tell you one thing. The CEO of Hydro One had zero, zero severance. I, under, I, understand, I understand that the Leader of the Opposition worked hand-in-hand -hand with the previous government, propping up the highest hydro rates in North America, propping up the highest gas prices in North America, wanting to have the highest carbon tax anywhere in the world. Matter of fact, one of our members said they want the highest carbon tax in the entire world. Yep, that's what they want. That is shameful. Final supplementary, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, no, ma no matter how much he wants to pretend he didn't say it, the Premier said the CEO's payout was zero, absolutely zero. But he knew that the CEO would leave with more money than most families in this province earn in a lifetime. The Premier turned the $6 million man into a $9 million man. It could be more. It could be more. The, only the Premier knows exactly how much that secret deal really costs. And if the Premier refuses to come clean and refuses to make his backroom deal public, then any new bill on executive compensation and transparency is just a joke. So will this Premier agree to amend the bill that he tabled yesterday to include full disclosure of all Boss. payments to outgoing executives and board members of Hydro One? Mr. Speaker, again, the CEO had a zero percent severance. Now you know. I have to ask the leader of the opposition to withdraw. Leader of the opposition stood side by side beside the previous premier as they were getting outrageous, absolutely outrageous wages, six million dollars. The leader of the opposition stood by. Yep. As board members worked seven days a year and was compensated $180,000 a year, the Leader of the Opposition yep. stood by and did not say a word. Yep. Yep. When the previous administration raised the hydro rates, the highest in North America, the Leader of the Opposition did absolutely nothing to protect the taxpayers of this province. We were given a clear mandate from the people of Ontario, a clear mandate to reduce their hydro rates by 12 per cent, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Members, take your seats. Please take your seats. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my question is to the Premier, but I would ask him to look at the answer to get a real understanding of what uh, we did as opposition here in the House. He, he needs to get uh, a little bit of education. In his first week in office— I have to ask the government members to please come to order. I can't hear the Leader of the Opposition. Please come to order. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, in his first week in office, the Premier quietly stopped the implementation of the Special Investigations Unit Act. But he hasn't told us why. And that has people across Ontario very worried, Speaker. Is this Premier getting ready to open the door wide open to carding and discriminatory, discriminatory police checks in our province again? Mr. Speaker, our party is going to give the tools to our police, all the tools they need to stop the gun violence that we've seen in these cities. Members, please take your seats. Please take Mr. Speaker, we support our police. We support our police. Unlike the Leader of the Opposition and unlike their party, that are police haters, military haters, veteran haters, poppy haters, and Thank you. 
mistake you think. I say to the government. No, I say. Take a seat. I say to the government members. First of all, you're cutting into the premier's time when you do this. Uh, these are standing ovations. First of all. Secondly, I'm asking the premier to withdraw. Withdraw. No. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. So you know. There is something called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in our country, and this premier needs to look it up and talk about what people deserve in terms of their rights. Members, please take your seats. I say to the official opposition members who are standing and applauding, you're cutting into your leader's time too. Leader of the opposition. Sorry, Speaker. When the Premier slammed the brakes on the new police oversight rule, he ignored more than two years of consultations. He ignored the voices of Ontarians, and he refuses to tell us why. And yesterday, the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services couldn't tell us either. So I'm going to ask again: Is this Premier going to drag Ontario backwards and start opening the door to carding once again in our province? Premier. Mr. Speaker, as I was saying earlier. Our party supports the police. We don't have any members. And again, I'll reinforce that we will give the police all the tools they need to get their job done. But I'll tell you one thing, because I wouldn't allow this. We didn't have any MPP, unlike the member from Brampton East that walked around running up and down the streets with a sign that says, F the police. That is disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Take your seats. Please take your seats. Please take your seats. Next question. The member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Speaker, as it is my first time rising in the House, I want to congratulate you on your election as Speaker and also thank the residents of my riding for electing me. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Over the past number of months, Toronto has seen a sharp rise in guns and gang violence, and that violence has been shocking to residents in my community and across the greater Toronto area. Our police officers and emergency responders are on the front lines in our community, helping to assuage the fears of residents, but they need more help. Can the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services please update the House on this important file? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member of Eglinton Lawrence, who's been an important advocate on this file and others in her community. And I'd also like to add that I grew up in the Eglinton Lawrence and my mom still lives uh, in that uh, riding. Gun violence has no place in Toronto, nor in any part of this province. <laughs> the brazen, indiscriminate attacks have to stop. With the rise in gun violence on our streets, it's clear in, and the, that current strategies and anti-gun units in the City of Toronto uh, are, are required and that we are dedicated to providing uh, services and oversight. We're committed to Response. police services across the province and to providing our officers with the tools and resources they need to keep communities safe. This isn't a partisan issue. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Edmonton Lawrence, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, during the campaign, we made a number of commitments to our police and other first responders. This included making sure that we respect our frontline officers and the work that they do in our communities every day. Can you please update the House on what you've been working on? Sure. Thank you again uh, uh, to the member for this important question. And safety of the public is our paramount concern. We've been clear from day one we are going to make sure we are giving our frontline officers the tools they need to do their job. We're committed to fixing Bill 175 and treating our frontline officers with respect. 
This includes a full and thorough review of the legislation governing police services and police oversight. By consulting experts, police services and the public, we will accomplish this goal. Mr. Speaker, our police officers put themselves in harm's way every day and work to keep our communities safe. We're committed to listening and consulting with our front line and ensuring they have the tools they work with. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Earlier this week, Speaker, the Premier's close friend and avid supporter, Charles McVitie, made his opinion about the repeal of the sexual health curriculum crystal clear. He said, the fruit of the poisonous tree has been cut down. Speaker, McVitie is a social conservative who lobbied hard for the modernized curriculum to be pulled out of schools, and this government was more than happy to make a deal with him. Does the minister think that it is appropriate to allow social conservative activists like Charles McVitie to drive Ontario's health and physical education program from the back room? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Congratulations on your re-election to this place. It's a pleasure to be back with you. Um, on behalf of my ministry, we're going to continue to stand up and protect children and youth. As, a, as the minister responsible for children and youth, I couldn't be more delighted to be in this ministry, given my roots started as, as a children and youth critic 12 years ago with your now leader of the official opposition. I congratulate her as well. Let me be perfectly clear. You would like to present one narrative. Let me speak as a mother who has a child that is 13 years old. Let me speak as a person who has watched as my daughter was confused with half of the things because it was not age appropriate. I don't know Charles McFeedy. He is not going to lead this process. The Minister of Education is going to lead this process, and the Minister of Education with parents will lead this process. Because the difference between us and you is you don't respect parents, you don't call up. Members, please take your seats. Back to the member for London West. Something completely different, like dignity and respect. <laughs> Speaker, yesterday this government confirmed that the new sexual health curriculum would be rolled back while claiming that there is ample room to discuss consent, cyber safety and gender identity, even though the old curriculum is completely silent on these critical issues. Instead of catering to pressure from inflammatory far-right activists like Charles McVitie, this government should be ensuring that young people have the accurate, up-to-date sexual health information information and resources they need to protect themselves. Will this minister confirm that her government rejects Charles McVitie's comments about the current up-to-date curriculum and commit to having an inclusive, modern sexual health curriculum in place for this September? Minister. Okay. Please take your seat. Please take your seat. Minister. I guess you didn't listen. Charles McVitie is not running the process. The Minister of Education is going to lead the process, and we're going to include parents. Because when parents were standing on that side of the aisle and when they were coming in to talk at committee, everybody was, you know, in the former Liberal administration, ignoring them. You were ignoring them in your party. We're simply saying we're going to talk about. I'm going to remind the, the high, entire House. You have to make your comments through the chair, and speak about other members if you speak about them in the third person. Minister. My apologies, uh, um, Speaker. Uh, let me just be perfectly clear. We are talking about being age appropriate. I have personally in this House talked about suicide prevention, children's mental health. We have talked about uh, concussions. We have talked about all sorts of other issues, including anti bullying, which I have legislation in my own name on. That will not change. <laughs> what will change is the respect that we will have for the parents of this province, through the Minister of Education, and through the parental process, and, the, and, and that will take place as we can solve the people. Members, will please take your seat. Please take your seat. Next question, member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. 
Jack in the Box. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Minister, as you know, Bruce Power provides 30 per cent of Ontario's electricity as a low-cost producer of power for families and businesses. Over the next four years, they will invest private dollars into the long-term future of their facility to secure low-cost power through 2064 and an estimated 22,000 direct and indirect jobs. Minister, are you supportive of Bruce Power's role in Ontario continuing? Minister of Energy. Are you asked? I, I certainly am, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Uh, I'd like to thank the member for Great Bruce Owen Sound for his strong representation of his constituents over the years and for standing up for Bruce Power. It's an important employer and producer of energy for our sector here in Ontario. Our government will always support the work of private organizations here in Ontario that are working to create good jobs, high-tech jobs, good union jobs. Uh, in our province while providing safe and secure access to energy. We are especially supportive, Mr. Speaker, of companies that achieve these goals without the need for public funding. I'm proud to be part of a government that believes in these important principles, as I know the member is. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Energy. Minister, that's great news for families and businesses who rely on this low-cost power and some 22,000 jobs in Bruce Gray on Sound and across the province. One of the key items, and here on Bruce, one of the key items that often doesn't get attention in its role, Bruce Power plays in supplying the world life-saving isotopes. This is an area you played a leadership role in during your tenure as Federal Natural Resources and Energy Minister. Minister, what does this mean to Ontario's leadership role as an isotope supplier? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We did face a pressing challenge to make sure that medical isotopes were, were available to, to people across Canada and especially here in Ontario. The private sector in Ontario in particular was challenged to step up to the plate and meet global isotope shortages, and I'm pleased that Bruce Power had demonstrated leadership in this area. By extending the life of the assets, they will not only generate low-cost, reliable power through 2064, but will continue to supply 40 per cent of the world's cobalt-60, used to keep hospitals Mr. Speaker, and health care clean and be the largest producer of medical-grade cobalt used to treat brain, treat, treat brain tumors. We think that's important, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to stand up for Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Question. Member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Yesterday, the government tabled Bill 2. It should have been called the Bad Faith Act, because this bill gives the government the power to break its own contracts, which will have a chilling effect. From now on, businesses will either have to add a bad faith risk premium onto the price of government contracts, driving up the price, or They'll have to make sure that they have a special relationship with the Premier and his inner circle that protects them from these sorts of arbitrary actions. Why would any company do business with the Ontario government when the Premier is willing to suspend the rule of law when it comes to contracts he personally doesn't like? Energy. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're in rarefied air when the NDP start talking about cost savings, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. But since they are, uh, let's talk about their election platform. It sounded like a Liberal version of the tax and spend buffet. Had they been listening to Ontarians, they would have heard that they wanted them to cut back on spending, lower hydro rates, Mr. Speaker, look for cost savings to the tune of $790 million. Now, 76 Progressive Conservative Party Ontario members are sitting in this place today because we were listening to what the people of Ontario were doing, Mr. Speaker. The difference? We were, we were for the people, they were for the prop, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I gather the Premier doesn't want to answer the question. I'll try another tack. Bill 2 includes a bizarre clause that protects the government lawsuits from lawsuits that allege, quote, misrepresentations within the meaning of applicable securities laws. Unquote. Exactly what misrepresentations has the Premier been making recently that he needs a law to protect himself from lawsuits? <laughs> the 
Open seat. I'm going to ask the member for Toronto Danforth to withdraw. Um, to withdraw. It's in the bill. He suggested the Premier was misrepresented. Asking the member to withdraw. Back to the Minister of Energy. Listen, it's been a great couple of weeks for ratepayers and taxpayers. If we start, if we start down the road to reducing hydro rates, and we've taken a couple of important uh, steps, Mr. Speaker. We're committed to reducing electricity bills by 12 percent, cutting them, Mr. Speaker, not subsidizing them, not punting them down the road for future generations to bear those costs. Winding down 758 contracts is, expect is expected to avoid long-term costs of $790 million. Wow. This, this approach, importantly, maximizes the benefits for ratepayers. We're ending the contracts where the benefits outweigh the costs, and we're safeguarding that with legislation to ensure that taxpayers realize even greater savings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question. I recognize the member for Guelph. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it's an honour to rise for my first question. And first, I'd like to congratulate you on your election as Speaker and congratulate all members of the 42nd Parliament. I'm looking forward to serving with each of you. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The climate crisis is the biggest threat facing humanity, and there is urgency for all of us to act. Fortunately, what is good for our planet is also good for our economy. The $7 trillion global clean economy is generating jobs and prosperity around the world, but cancelling Ontario's plan to price pollution without an alternative plan sends the wrong signal to clean economy, investors and companies. So my question to the Premier is, does the government have an economic analysis on the effects of your decision to dismantle our climate change programs on clean tech investments question. and job creation? And if you have such an economic analysis, will you make it public? To the Minister of Environment, to the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and congratulations as well to the member uh, on his election. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as the member knows, uh, the Doug Ford PC government was elected with a plan. The plan was to get rid of the regressive cap and trade carbon tax program of the previous government. This was a program that the opposition thought didn't go far enough. It was a program that was killing jobs and making life difficult for average Ontarians. We understand the importance of climate change. We agree that steps need to be taken, and those steps will be forthcoming. But they won't be steps that take the burden and put the burden on individual Ontarians. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it is so important to have an economic analysis because the decision to dismantle programs like Green On, electric vehicle rebates, and energy saving school repairs is hurting businesses, consumers, and public facilities. It's a decision that takes money out of the pockets of people who want to lower their energy bills. It makes it harder for people to afford a car that will save them money at the pumps. It makes it harder for schools to reduce their energy bills. It's a decision that hurts local businesses. Mr. Speaker, I would like to redirect my question to the Premier. Premier, will you bring forward a climate plan with financial supports for people, businesses and schools to make investments to save money by saving energy while lowering their carbon footprint? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question, the member. Uh, again, we recognize the importance of dealing with emissions, um, but we disagree with the idea that, that it is about government's choices around how people spend their money. We disagree that, uh, that it is up to government to make those choices for individual Ontarians. We will come forward with a responsible plan, a plan that tackles the issue of emissions, but a plan that does not punish ordinary Ontarians. We'd like the taxpayers to have the dollars in their pockets. Yeah. Yeah. The member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. In my riding Peterborough, Kawartha, 
organizers of the Peterborough Music Fest mm. are anxiously waiting on grant money from the Celebrate Ontario Fund that was promised by the former government. They were approved for grant money before the election, but payments were frozen to a number of festivals and events across Ontario. Without funding, the organizers will have to cancel a number of the scheduled events, and the City of Peterborough will lose an enormous amount of tourism revenue. Can the Minister update us as to when this approved money will flow to Peterborough Music Fest and other festivals and events across the province? Thank you, Speaker. May I say you look excellent in the chair. I know that you will serve our legislature well. So congratulations. To the member for Peterborough Kawarthas, thank you for your question. It is an honour to be able to serve with you, and I know you will be an excellent constituency uh, representative for your riding because you are already advocating for your community. Uh, the member is absolutely right. The festival and the Celebrate Ontario uh, program was put on hold during the, uh, the transition. We had to make sure that due diligence was done, that we ensured that the uh, funds that were promised were accurate and needed and necessary. And I can sure, assure the member from Peterborough Kawarthas that you will get your money, and I hope you enjoy the festival. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. I'd like to thank the minister for the answer. I'd also like to congratulate the minister on her re-election by the constituents of dufferin Caledon. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that this government's mandate is for the people. I'd also like to. I'd also like to know if there are any other initiatives that the minister and the government are putting forward. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. You know, there, there is no doubt that festivals like Peterborough Music Festival or the Timmins uh, Rock on the River or the Beaches Jazz Festival in Toronto are critically important to our communities. We all understand it brings in tourism dollars. It makes what, uh, what makes Ontario special. I encourage all members to participate and enjoy those festivals that are across Ontario. As I said, there are over 100 festivals that were lined up for the uh, the. Uh, sorry for the uh, funding dollars, and those have flowed. So enjoy your festivals. Next question, member for Nickelback. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The last Liberal government pushed Ontario hospitals to the brink. Hallway medicine and painfully long wait times have become the norms in our hospital, but. Instead of taking urgent step to fix it, the Premier handed out a contract worth over $1 million to one of his friends, the former president of the Conservative Party. Why was the Premier's first act in health care an act of blatant political patronage? Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much for the question. The fact of the matter is that the state of hallway medicine in Ontario was so bad that we needed advice, and the person who is providing that advice and leading an advisory council is going to be providing information on ending hallway medicine, on innovation, bringing more efficiencies into the system so that we can expand health care. That council is going to be providing advice both to myself and to the Premier so that we can end this situation and improve health care so that we don't have hospitals operating at over 100 per cent capacity virtually every day. Supplementary. Back to the Premier Speaker. In 2006, the hospitals run by Dr. Devlin had the second worst death rate in all of Canada. Oh, Nurses one. warned of chronic understaffing in all of his hospital. And then he shut down three Toronto hospitals and replaced them by P3 Hospital. Now, apparently, he's contracted to fix the entire health care system. Why did the Premier hand out a million-dollar contract to his friend, the former president of the Conservative Party? Minister. 
Well, I can tell the member it was done because the state of affairs is so bad right now, and what happened before was not that person's responsibility but the government's responsibility. So what we need to do is to create this council, get them moving as soon as possible so that we can end the situation with hallway medicine, because as bad as it is right now, once we have flu season hit in a couple of months, it's going to become worse if we don't take action right away. That's what Order. the council is looking at, and both the Premier and I are looking forward to the recommendations. Next question, Member for Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, my, my question is to the Minister of Energy. Yesterday, the Minister of Energy tabled a bill that included the Hydro One Accountability Act 2018. The Hydro One Accountability Act 2018 would require the Board of Hydro One to establish a new compensation framework for the Board of Directors, CEO, and other executives in consultation with the province and the other five largest shareholders. The Act would also give Management Board of Cabinet authority to approve the compensation framework and any amendments to it, as well as to issue directives governing the compensation of the directors, CEO, and other executives. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain why this is an important step in cleaning up the hydro mess left behind by the previous government? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to congratulate the member for Simcoe North on her election and welcome her to this magnificent place. Under the strong, strong leadership of Premier Ford, Mr. Speaker, we've moved quickly over the past couple of weeks to renew the leader, set in place a process to renew the leadership of Hydro One. This is of critical importance to our province's electricity system, and our government will be closely engaging in the leadership transition at Hydro One to ensure the stability of the system is pres uh, preserved and customers are protected. That's why we've prepared legislation that, if passed, will in improve transparency and accountability at Hydro One. The Hydro One Accountability Act 2018 will require the board to establish a new compensation framework Answer. for the board, CEO, and other executives in consultation with the province and uh, the other five largest shareholders, Mr. Speaker. This represents a renewal for a cleaner, better. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Further, yesterday's act would amend the Ontario Energy Board Act 1998 to require the Ontario Energy Board to exclude any amount in respect of compensation paid to the Chief Executive Officer and executives from consumer rates for Hydro One Limited or its subsidiaries. In addition, the act would require Hydro One to annually publish on its website a record of the total compensation of executives as prescribed by regulation. The act would re also require Hydro One to publish on its website any proposed changes to its compensation frameworks for this board, CEO, or other executives at least 30 days prior to the date on which it se seeks approval. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain why these are important steps to restore trust and accountability at Hydro One and the energy sector? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the careful attention that this member has put to this piece of legislation. Public, public accountability is an important element uh, of this legislation. The process that we're undertaking will enhance trust and accountability, not only at Hydro One, but across the energy sector, Mr. Speaker. As the member rightly points out, this legislation requires Hydro One to publish any proposed changes to its compensation policies for the board, CEO, and executives 30 days prior to seeking management board of cabinet approval. We will also require Hydro One to annually publish a record of the total annual compensation of the executives on their websites. Mr. Speaker, this demonstrates a clear and decisive set of um, actions that we're taking to ensure Hydro One is renewed leadership on the right path to reducing hydro weight rates for ratepayers across this great province. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. The member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Acting Premier. Yesterday, I asked the Premier about our refugee crisis and federal funding. The Premier passed me off to the member from Nepean, who did a lot of yelling and posturing about who's more Canadian, and gave me a list of racialized MPPs in the PC caucus. But yesterday's hooting and hollering does nothing to solve this crisis, and this government's lack of clarity is making things worse. 
Because of the lack of clarity, the House of Commons Standing Committee on Citizenship and Immigration had to hold an emergency meeting on Parliament Hill yesterday. Conflating issues and collapsing ministries has been a running theme of this government, and we're only in week one. So I'd like to ask the Premier again, why on earth would this government walk away from $11 million to help our cities? Is it because you haven't yet figured out how to redirect it into the pockets of your corporate friends? Spot. Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Community and Social Services. We have children, community, and social services. Thanks very much for the question to my colleague from Oshawa. Uh, she asked me why I would walk away for $11 million. Clearly, math is not the strong suit in the official opposition. The price tag is $175 million and growing. And I'm going to tell you something. My ministry is quite large. We look after children in care. We look after children who have autism. We look after children with de developmental disabilities. We look after the welfare system. We look after ODSP. We look at women who are escaping domestic violence, and we look after women who are being trafficked. So I ask you this, and I hope you have a response for me. Where do you want to take the money from, those vulnerable people or from the federal government who created a mess at the border and owes this province $175 million? Please take your seats. Members, take your Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. Yesterday during question period, the member from Nepean hollered, we're going to continue to welcome people to Ontario and we're going to continue to support them. But at the same time, this government is neither welcoming nor supportive of asylum seekers in Ontario. And during the PC electoral campaign, a statement was issued that read, quote, while funding for refugees is primarily a federal issue, Doug Ford will sit down with Mayor Tory to ensure the city has the funding it needs, end quote. Primarily a federal issue means mostly. But, and I'll explain to the team, it is also a provincial responsibility, both morally and legally. The people of Ontario and our municipalities are looking to the provincial government to do the right thing and help people who are seeking refuge. While you waste precious time going back and forth about which level of government should shoulder the expense, refugees and asylum seekers are Question. suffering. Premier, I hope that the Premier will do the right thing. Will they provide the much-needed housing to these families before the August 9th eviction date? Minister. Immigration and refugee policy is under the purview of the federal government. No one disputes that. The issue that we have today is we have $75 million in housing costs for the City of Toronto. We have an additional $11 million cost for the City of Ottawa, where I live. We have a $90 million and growing social assistance cost as a result of this. You're telling me to take six cents on the dollar when I should be fighting for the people of this province. Okay. I'm going to once again ask the members and remind the members you have to speak through the chair and, and talk of other members in the third person. The minister. Speaker, I should speak. The member opposite is telling me that I should accept six cents of the dollar. I can't afford that. This province can't afford that. And the people that I'm responsible for, that I stay awake at night worrying about, can't afford it. So she can either stand with me or against me in my fight Thank with you. Ottawa to get fair compensation for this province. Thank you. Members, please take your seat. Please take your seat. Next question. Member for King Vaughan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour. Minister, tens of thousands of students at York University from across the GTA have been adversely affected by months of inaction. Mr. Speaker, the York University strike has gone on for too long. I have received numerous calls from my constituents, from students at York U, and members of their families who are very concerned about this ongoing strike, which has kept them from the classroom. Our constituents want action. They want government to put students first. Minister, I was very pleased to learn through you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I was pleased to learn that our new government is moving forward with one of our promises to the people of Ontario with the introduction of legislation that will finally end the strike at York University. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the opposition has indicated they intend to stall this important legislation and keep students out of the classroom. Minister, can you commit today to move forward with this legislation and get our students back in the classroom? Members, the 
please take their seats. Please take your seats. Response, the Minister of Labour. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to congratulate the member from King Vaughan on his election to the legislature. I know he will represent his constituents well, and I want to congratulate the Speaker on his election as Speaker of this Legislature. The member from King Vaughan is exactly right. This is about getting students back to the classroom. Finding a resolution to this uh, situation is one of our immediate priorities. There are more than 45,000 students affected by this strike. They're concerned about losing their school year, and they're uncertain for their future. The strike has gone on for more than 100 days, Mr. Speaker. Going back to it, started in March 5th, Mr. Speaker. So we have every uh, indication that both sides are deadlocked. There is no resolution in sight. We need to get the two parties back to the table, and the priority is to get the students back to the classroom. Thank you. Supplementary. I'd ask the members to please take their seats. I'd ask the members to please take their seats. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. Minister, thank you for your leadership on this file, and thank you for moving with a sense of urgency to, for the sake of our young people. While we know the NDP is ill-prepared to put our students first under this minister, under this premier, under this government, we are governing for the people, for the next generation, and for those who want to work hard and get ahead in this province. Now, we know these students have been out of the classroom for four months, for far too long. So, Minister, through you, Mr. Speaker, could you elaborate on why it is so important that we get this legislation passed without delay? Let's get these kids back in the classroom. Yeah. Thank you. Response. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, again, the students have suffered long enough. Over 45,000 students being affected, uh, and they are frightened about the future of their education. They shouldn't have to face this uncertainty. You know, this is the longest strike in post-secondary education in Canada. It needs to be resolved. This is one of the media priorities that the Premier and his government want to have is to get the students back to the classroom. This is why we've introduced legislation. We need to get the two parties back to the negotiating table, and we need to get the students back to the classroom, and that's what we as the government intend to do. Thank you. Next question, the member for Down. Through you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. For years, the parent-led group Fix Our Schools has been calling on the government to make urgent repairs to Ontario's schools. Days before the election, they circulated a pledge asking candidates to make a public commitment to finally eliminate the astonishing $16 billion repair backlog. I signed that pledge, and I, indeed, many Conservative MPPs, including our own Minister of Education, signed their names to that pledge. And yet, as soon as this government was sworn in, it turns around and quietly guts $100 million in funding for very urgent school repairs. Why is this government already breaking its promise to the students and families of Ontario? To the Minister of the Environment. Environment. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, through you, the members referring to the funding that was being provided by the cap and trade carbon tax program. This government was exceptionally clear, this party was exceptionally clear, that it would eliminate that regressive tax, and as a result, we are working with our transfer partners to go through the orderly wind down of the funding that came from that program. That's what you can expect from this government. We'll make a promise, and we'll keep a promise. Here, here. Here, here. Supplementary. For, for you, Mr. Speaker, my question again to the Minister of Education, who signed this pledge. The state of our schools in Ontario is appalling. 
They are crumbling. Across this province, they are literally falling apart. And, oh, I know. I know after 15 years of Liberal mismanagement. Don't get me wrong. I know that. But in my own riding, I have schools like Alexander Muir Gladstone, where the roof was so bad last year, they had to use the kindergarten water tables to catch the leaks. They have an urgent repair list of 44 major repairs needed in that one school alone. I want to know, and I don't want to. I, I want to hear this from the Minister of Education, please. You made a pledge. I don't care where you get it. You cut $100 million in repairs that we urgently need in our communities. Parents expect them. You talk about the importance of parents and how you're listening to them. Listen to them now. Fix Our Schools is a parent-led organization. You signed the, the, the pledge. How many more students are going to have to go sit through the next year sitting in leaky classrooms you, wearing hats and mitts before you live up to your pledge? Please take your seat. Please take your seat. Mr. of the Environment. Minister of Education. So, Speaker, I'm very pleased to rise on the occasion of our second day back in the 42nd Parliament to address this very serious issue that evolved under 15 years of mismanagement of the former Liberal government. Here, here. Remind the speaker that during my seven years here, it was the party opposite, the Prop opposition party that propped this Prop government up, up that and up. allowed the continued disintegration of the schools. And so, with that said, I'm pleased to share with you, Speaker, that we're working with our ministry officials because fixing our schools are very important. We're going to fix and address the issue that evolved under the former Liberal government because our students deserve that. Thank you, Thank you very much. Question, Northumberland, member for Northumberland, Peterborough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As this is the first time I rise, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my family, uh, my remarkable campaign team, and the great people of my community that elected me the first ever uh, MPP for the great riding of Northumberland, Peterborough South. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Yesterday, the Minister of Energy tabled legislation. It included a portion that would enact the White Pines Wind Project Termination Act 2018. This, if passed, would terminate this contract and any related regulatory approvals and permits of the White Pines Wind Project retroactive to July 10, 2018. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy explain why cancelling this project required legislation? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to welcome the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, uh, and for his immediate work on this uh, file, and also to the MPP for the Bay of Quinte, who's also represented this, uh, this project. Our government has been clear we would take action to reduce electricity bills immediately for Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. This includes cancelling any energy project that does not provide rate reductions for Ontarians due to the fact that this project faced considerable considerable local and public opposition. I'm pleased to announce that our government introduced legislation to terminate this contract and any regulatory approvals and permits for White Pines Wind Project retroactive to July 10th. This legislation requires White Pines Wind Incorporated to decommission their project in accordance with any regulations put forth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister of Energy. Thank you for your swift action on this. Uh, Prince Edward County was an unwilling host. The support of this government is being celebrated across Prince Edward County and into my riding of Northumberland, Peterborough South. It was shocking to hear that this project would have been approved during the caretaker period. It was clear the county didn't want the project, nor did the members that formed government. I understand care has been taken to protect Ontarian interests. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy explain how cancelling this project will benefit Ontarians? Minister. A smart guy, Mr. Speaker. Thinking about this project, it, you know, th th our government is committed to cancelling contracts for Ontarians 
not simply that they don't need, but that they don't want. Imagine that, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we're doing. The previous Liberal government made it their mission to expand renewable energy contracts that were unsustainable and unaffordable. They included solar and industrial wind turbines, Mr. Speaker. We're cancelling this project because we're going to protect the interests of Ontario taxpayers. We're going to un protect Ontario people. Thank you, Mr. Well, Speaker. Members, please take their seat. Please take your seat. Please take your seat. Member for Brampton East. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the acting premier. Auto insurance premiums in, on in, in Ontario are 55% higher than in the rest of Canada. That amounts to $4 billion that could be in the pockets of everyday Ontarians if our rates were at the rate of the national average. This is gouging Ontario drivers, and it needs to stop. But last week, this Conservative government allowed premiums to increase by another 1.1 per cent. This shows exactly whose interests the Conservative government have in mind, and it is not everyday working Ontario families. Will this government commit, here and now, to lowering auto insurance rates by 15 per cent? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Sure. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you uh, to the member opposite for the question here this morning. You know, it's interesting uh, when you look back at what's happened over the last couple of years in this legislature. I've been here for seven years now. Uh, the members opposite supported the previous Liberal government when they said that they were going to reduce auto insurance rates by 15 per cent. And then the previous Liberal government said that, well, that was stretch just a stretch goal. Stretch You'll remember that, Mr. Speaker, but the members opposite supported the government anyway. They continued to prop up the government. Yeah. You know, Mr. Speaker, the people of Ontario said it loud and clear on June 7th that they've had enough of the empty promises. They've had enough of the stretch goals. They want a government that's going to look after their interest, a government that's going to put more money back in their pockets, a government that is going to clean up accountability. That concludes the time we have for question period. That concludes the time we have for question period. I recognize that there's a great deal of enthusiasm in the House, this being the first week where we've had a regular question period, uh, but I would like to point out that there were numerous standing ovations on both sides of the House, and I point out that you're just cutting in your own time, which reduces the number of questions that might be asked in the House, and I ask you to consider that. The member for Hamilton Mountain on a point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome some guests uh, for my ceremonial swearing in today. Uh, in the House, uh, I have my father, Mike Taylor, and his wife, Pauline. I have uh, one of my constituency assistants, Andrea Hogan, as well as one of my campaign volunteers, Aidan McGilvin. Later uh, this afternoon, we'll be joined uh, by my mother, Barbara Piper, and my sister, Nicole Taylor. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you very much. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 98C, changes have been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Mr. Harris assumes ballot item number 94, Mrs. Fee assumes ballot item number 2, Mr. Oosterhoff assumes ballot item number 3, and Ms. Kusendova assumes ballot item number 22. There being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>